Hello everyone, my name is Jess Wilcox. I'm the Programs Coordinator here at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. I want to thank everyone for coming today to this fabulous, soon to be fabulous panel titled The Future is History, Feminist Legacies in Contemporary Art, which I think is quite aptly uh, titled since this is the sixth annual collaboration or um, panel discussion collaboratively organized by AIR Gallery and the Institute of Women in Art at Rutgers. Um, so we're building our own little legacy here, which is very exciting. Um, I want to thank Daria DeRoche and Leah Devon for doing such an excellent job putting this panel together. Um, I'm not one for big, long introductions, so I will have you note that all the bios of our panelists are here um, on this handout, which you can find. There were some up here, but perhaps in the back as well. Um, but as I said, I'm not one for long introductions, and I know we have a lot to talk about, so I'm just going to hand it over. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our discussion, and thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Daria Dorsch. I'm an artist and a co-founding member of AR Gallery. I am also a current member of that gallery, and I also teach fashion design at the Fashion Institute of Technology. When Leah and I began to talk about this panel, we thought that the best place to start would be from a beginner's eye, to look at legacy freshly, since none of the models really seem to be working for us. So we looked at questions like, well, what is legacy? And why should we care? <coughs> okay, so <laughs> this is my kind of legacy. And I'm in trouble in the best terms. And I think we can do it because we always have, right? Okay. Now, the format tonight is that we only have about seven minutes a piece to talk. So, and then we'll have a discussion between us and then with all of you. So uh, I will just go right along with the next slide. This slide takes us back to the early 70s when uh, women got together and started their own organizations. At that time, just to say briefly, the main goal was to get equal representation in an art world that didn't want us. So, here we are, 42 years later, we're looking at a poster by the Gorilla Girls, and we can decide, you know, have we gotten anywhere? Well, a little bit. We are in some galleries, in some museums. Um, the art world has been blown open by the inclusion of women. But I'm afraid that I don't have much faith in this model. And the reason is that I think gender equality will destroy the art world. Matter of fact, I think the art world and the larger world is so, so much a, a two-way system. It's, it's an either-or world that will not work for the future for anybody. And um, when you read a book like The Third uh, Industrial Revolution by economist Jeremy, Jeremy Rifkin, you will see that he's pointing to the new model being this model, a collaborative, a collaborative, cooperative model, a nonprofit model, networks getting together, um, and people having fun and being creative. That's the new model that the economists are talking about. But we have some other issues to address. This is a photograph of 11 of the AR members in 1978. And as I look through my file, I see that three of them are no longer with us. Anna Mendieta, Nancy Sparrow, Rachel bosco -Hain. We have lost these artists. And at the gallery, what we will try to do is to start a legacy project to take them back into the gallery after they've gone, in some way, even if it's just on our website. And the big question for my generation of artists is, hmm, it's going to be dumpster or archive? We don't know yet. Well, why should we care about legacy? I think because there are still questions that we have not even looked at. 
You know, my generation of artists, many who are sitting in this audience, we lived through that transition from analog to digital. We're the only ones who know what really happened and is buried in our work. If you looked at our work and if you analyze our work, you would see what happened. A few of the things that happened is that the minimalist grid turned into a pixel grid. Another thing that happened is that art has gotten ephemeral. The whole culture has become ephemeral. Time has been flattened. We've seen the changes and we can talk about them if there is a legacy. This is a little proposal that I did in the 80s uh, for a show called The Homeless at Home when artists were being kicked out of their lofts. And I think the audience here will know that real estate is at the heart of many of our issues. And this was a project proposing artist lofts between commercial buildings. Well, why not? Artist studios and more gem-like beautiful things, because that's what we do. Put them between buildings. Well, another question that's been bothering me and I've been talking to my friends about is what do artists want? What do women artists want? That's a really tough one to answer because if in your mind you say, I want the old world of galleries, museums, the blue chip system, I don't know if that's going to be available. There's too many of us, even for good artists. So what do artists want? What do women artists want? Needs a lot of conversations to come between all of you actually, all of us. Ah, my favorite question for myself actually. I've been bothered by where does art belong? Hmm, I'm looking at the demise of the middle class, which I never thought would happen in my entire life. These are the people we dissed in the 60s and 70s. And now they're, I feel fondly because they're going away. So is the notion of property. We're losing things that we thought would be here forever. We're losing our walls. And what's coming in this place? It's something that you have right now. I bet every single one of you has this in your pocket. It's your cell phone. If you notice, things are landing on our body. It's cell phones, it's nanotechnology, it's... Uh, in my readings, there is a microbiological world that is being built as we sleep that wants your body. Well, this is a good place for women. Women know a lot about the body. So where does art belong? This is my, one of my answers to myself. My last exhibition was soft, cuddly, semi-sexual toys for grown-ups. They were portable sculptures that you could take anywhere and fondle and play with and have as a companion to get you through your hard day. And they were little. And I just somehow want to compete with that cell phone, you know, like, how did it get so close to us? Why can't art get that close? This is not fair. Okay. And my last slide. I noticed when I was doing some research that something that really blew me away. Text, which is our narrative culture right now, Textile, which is all our weaving, sewing, constructing right now, and technology, which is living right on your body right now and getting to be into your body, they all come from the same root. What does that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> but it means something. How could they all be together and we never noticed? So I think women have a lot to offer to that discussion. And with that last note, I pass this over to my colleague, Leah Dillon. So as a historian and an artist who works with historical subjects, I want to spend just a few minutes thinking about um, what possibilities might exist in uh, revisiting history artistically and um, what kind of connections we might make between um, generations of feminists, particularly outside the spheres of academia or arts institutions and places where we think of history as being generated. Um, I want to frame my comments by talking about um, by, uh, through the lens of a project that I've been doing on women's lands and through it to talk about the way in this project uh, legacy is for me a part of artistic practice, a part of activism, and, and kind of a part of um, inquiring into what feminism is. So, women's lands. For those of you guys who don't know, women's lands are all-female communes. Um, they're usually... In 
Oh, can you not hear me? Okay, it's like you have to get really close. All right. Um, women's lands are um, uh, these communes. Um, they're mostly in rural areas, and a lot of them uh, date back to the 1970s. And I'll just run through a couple pictures here. And these are uh, uh, at a time. They're built at a time when people went back to the land, as many of you guys know, um, trying to come up with communities that rejected patriarchy and capitalism. Um, but what a lot of people aren't aware of is that a lot of the women's lands are still in existence. And they're places where, uh, mostly uh, living spaces for older lesbians and also places where women can travel to. And um, uh, there's even like a, a she wolf's directory to women's lands. This is kind of like the lonely planet for women's lands if you want to go visiting them across the country. So one of my long-term projects has been about asking what feminist space is, what it was, or what's lost or gained by building it. And this kind of snowballed into an interest in feminist collectives and a road trip across the country to, um, to a bunch of women's lands in the South. So I wanted to document the lands as they were, but also I was interested in, um, in creating these kind of re-performances of scenes, historical scenes that took place on the land with the idea that this would help me and the people involved in the project to engage with history in kind of a more like embodied, experiential way. Not history like you read, but, but history, something about doing history, that by doing something with ourselves, we preserve history, but also we kind of transform it by our participation. So, this has ended up um, culminating in a bunch of performances and photographs. But to do this project, I ended up having to have, um, or wanting to have, a bunch of conversations with like a bunch of dykes in their in their 60s and 70s. And for me, that was like um, like a really transformative experience because those were voices that I hadn't heard much before um, from, and because it kind of overturned a lot of assumptions that I had about what older generations of feminists think about a lot of things. So I just want to touch on um, just couple of concerns that I think are, or things to think about um, uh, with respect to art that engages historically and memory, um, and it was my art and maybe other artists working in the same vein. And the first is the issue of nostalgia, which I think is kind of like an occupational hazard in my work. I think if you're making work that's kind of about like feminism in the 1970s, there's this tendency, I mean, to um, kind of a, a maybe a critical celebration of these past moments of feminism and some of the, the objects or material remains that come from feminism. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it, that's a photograph of a tie, and the pattern on the tie is like, thumbs up for women's lip. Um, and I can't help but kind of love that. Um, and so, I mean, you know, I think that some of this like a kind of like feeling or like love of archival items is part of the power of work like this, but also something that we need to question. Um, and, um, but I think on the flip side, a sort of like a rejection of nostalgia or being too critical of nostalgia um, can lead us to a place where we might make the assumption that um, younger generations of feminists don't have that much to learn from older feminists because you know, maybe their, their politics are too problematic or um, they may uh, differ from younger feminists in their position on debates as they've evolved over, um, over decades. And you know, feminism does have problems, problems with social justice, racial justice, trans misogyny, um, but also I think that um, what might be implicit in that stance is that those are problems of past feminism. And we need to keep a recognition that these, these problems continue into kind of contemporary um, uh, feminist and queer communities. A lot of the conversations, I probably don't have to tell you, that feminists were having in the 1970s, specifically around women's lands, what feminist space is, um, you know, who could um, or should occupy a women's space, or even what it means to be a woman. I mean, these are obviously conversations we're still having, and ones that are deeply inflected by this history, whether or not younger generations of feminists know about that or not. So, um, the last thing I just want to say is, you know, I think the women's lands often are something that um, people think about as being, you know, like part of a past that's over. You know, maybe not something that um, is so relevant now to the moment that we're having. Um, but I don't know about you guys, but I can't go through like a day in New York City without hearing people complain about gentrification or real estate. We're all going to talk about real estate. We can't get away from it, people. Um, you know, or um, community sustainability, all those kinds of things. And I've been hearing more and more people trying to solve these problems, um, putting together maybe collectives or trying to pool their money to build, I mean, to buy like a building and put it in a land trust and try to like 
rest some tiny piece of the city away from this market economy. And I think that this is a place where um, the strategies that feminists in previous generations um, might resonate with or come together with um, things that people are thinking about like really urgently right now. And I just want to say that the, the land dykes, the people who lived on the women's lands, they kind of have a reputation for being sort of isolationist, not really like that involved in um, you know, the politics of the moment or the outside world. But in the travels and conversations that I had with, um, with these women, I was so struck by how eager they were to have conversations like this, to talk to people who are of a younger generation of feminism, um, to, uh, to share knowledge that they said, you know, had been passed on to them by their um, predecessors, their um, older generations of women to them. And these were things that have to do with politics and memory, but, but also things like how to run a chainsaw. <laughs> I mean, if you're a women's lit, you really do need to know how to run a chainsaw. <laughs> Something that I did not learn how to do in my life. Um, but I think that um, these are points of contact that we might find an opportunity to build um, alternative lineages, um, lineages that are um, based outside of those of family or those outside of academia, maybe places where people are often looking for mentorship or, or points of um, intergenerational contact that, I mean, let's face it, um, more and more aren't available or aren't working for a lot of people in our communities. So um, maybe building and um, I'm going to say maybe even building with chainsaws, I like things kind of noisy, a little scary, um, is an image that I want to end with. Um, so I'd like to think of those kind of expansive ways of creating histories, um, places for like doing something together physically, um, and the way that that might create alternative histories. Histories like what might have been versus what did happen and what might still happen, um, extending that past into the future. I'd like to thank you all for coming in out tonight and to say I'm extremely heartened to see such a large audience for this panel. Um, when Daria had asked me to participate, I was a little surprised, um, although I'm an art historian with an advanced degree in theory, and I have written on feminist artists. The idea of legacy in relation to feminism, um, while intriguing to me, was an issue that I had not thought about. However, as we age, um, this idea of legacy, while not clearly articulated or addressed for us, becomes more important as we assess our lives and the quality of what's going to remain once they end. This is not a morbid preoccupation, um, but rather uh, I think everyone, if given the leisure of time and a certain thoughtful temperament, reflects on your achievements, or your lack thereof, with a mixture of pleasure and regret. However, Darius specifically asked me to speak on the idea of legacy because for the last year or so I've been working on a project that's focused on the preservation of legacy of historic buildings in New York City, trying to raise the awareness of the importance of what some preservationists call our rich architectural legacy. With this in mind, I'm going to weave together a number of themes and probably raise more questions than I'll answer. Before we decide what a feminist legacy might be, it seems that some clarification is in order. For preservationists, and I think for most of us, legacy encompasses material objects, buildings with aesthetic, cultural, social value. The piece of gold jewelry or silver tea set that your grandmother may have left you, a valuable object. And generally, legacy is a material object. It's something that has monetary value. And when we think of our architectural legacy, New York City real estate, it does have a great deal of monetary value. For more than the last three centuries, since the arrival of European colonial powers, the real estate market has assigned monetary value to building stock and sites throughout New York City. But the idea of legacy, that is an object with value, and that value accessible only through a market. And preservation, together, is almost paradoxical. That is, while some think thinkers may link preservation to gentrification, and that's another topic for another panel, um, increasingly, uh, that's a topic, a tactic, excuse me, used by developers to align their interests with progressive politics. And we're seeing that in the idea of linking development to affordable housing today in New York City. 
Preservationists want to ensure that what they see as their architectural legacy is not monetized, or at least that the market forces of monetization are held in check by the aesthetic cultural value of the object that's going to be preserved. Certainly over the last 50 years, the real estate markets made some accommodations with this idea of historic preservation, and they now use the idea of the landmark or architectural legacy as a way to assign additional value to its product. So they burnish the luster of the object through this idea of the landmark or the aesthetic value of the object. But this tension is continuing through monetization and preservation between these two, as any reader of the daily papers and blogs can attest. So this example of architectural legacy that I'm putting out tonight um, suggests that the monetary value of the object defines in part the market value of the object. But it also suggests that the value of legacy is not as an object only. Its value has an aesthetic, social, or cultural aspect, the art object. Unlike the current protections afforded the legacy of architecture in New York City, and many would say those are insufficient, through the offices of the city's Landmarks Preservation Commission, there is no Artist Preservation Commission. There's no government agency that's charged with protecting the artistic legacy of New York. And that leaves us with the problem of how an artist conveys their legacy to the generations after them. At this point in the early 21st century, the primary mechanism that we can identify is the art market. This system of galleries and museums determines that objects are reviewed for their aesthetic and cultural value, and then they're winnowed out by the impartial, supposedly impartial hand of market forces to separate the wheat from the chaff and to determine what's to be preserved. In fact, we could say that the role of the art market is to ensure the survival of objects that have value, that is, that have monetary value in which the market has invested. That's not to say that these objects do not have cultural, social value, but simply that without an assigned monetary value, art objects are unlikely to survive as a legacy. This suggests that if we rely on the art market that is, as it's currently structured to ensure our legacy, or any legacy, we can only be sure that the objects that survive will be those that have monetary value in our current or near future market. Another way to think about the question of legacy and survival is to ask the question, if art created by women is given the same monetary value as that created by men, have we achieved a feminist breakthrough? If we want to preserve a feminist legacy, is this feminism? Or is this the idea of letting market forces determine value and insufficient solution to ensuring a feminist legacy? Some would say that we need to preserve the art of women in the same way that we preserve the art of men. I would agree. Holding fiercely on to the image of the heroic artist, we would like to valorize women in the same way to raise them up as models for emulation and admiration. This type of legacy would be in line with the creation of artist foundations that have as their mission the promotion and preservation of the work of an individual female artist. And these foundations do help. They help younger artists see that success, as success is defined in our society, that is money, power, and fame can be grasped by women. And we can see that there's value in that effort. There's value in younger artists having role models. Similarly, other organizations have as their mission the identification and preservation of artwork by women. They serve a similar function to ensure that parity is achieved within the history of art, which is the history looked to by artists and art historians and eventually by the market. They preserve a legacy of women artists, preserving the works made by women through documentation and restoration. This is not to say that the establishment of a parallel discourse of the female heroic artist, like the male heroic artist, who breaks through mediocrity to create a reputation of valued work, has not been an important step in feminism. Nor is it to say that we have passed that point in history. The work of the Gorilla Girls is as relevant today as it was 30 years ago, and if parity is our goal, we are far from finding uh, any equality or balance of 
male and female artists represented in galleries and museums. But this brings me to the crux of the matter. Um, are women who make art necessarily making feminist art? Or is feminist artwork and its legacy more particular, more specific, rather than gender driven? Can men make feminist art? That's a question. Can men participate in the feminist legacy? That will depend on how we define that legacy, but I would hazard a yes rather than a no. If we conflate women and feminism, if, we, if biology is again destiny, we are ultimately stating that the only beneficiaries of feminism are female. But can we continue to automatically link feminism to gender? Are only women feminists? Do we have to retain that term for ourselves? Or given the very thorough analysis of the construction of personal identity played out through Lacanian, Foucaultian, and other French theorists, after 30 plus years of thinking about how we become who we are, can we still link feminism, femininity, and even femaleness to our biology? I think we would have to say that. That's a question someone else might want to take up. So another question might be posed, is this, market is this market model of legacy the model on which we as feminists want to rely? Or on which we can rely? This market model, while the reality, or I can say one of the realities within which we operate and will probably continue to operate, says that parity is possible, that with equal access to a market, we will achieve equality. Whether that is true is questionable. But let us say for the sake of argument that it is true. We need to think about whether we are looking for parity within an existing system, or will feminist legacy require a change in the market system? Can artists operate productively outside of this market? Theoretical discourse of the 1980s and 90s suggested that there were alternatives, that we could explore the margins and edges between different discourses. But as a historian, I wonder if there haven't always been, say, marginal, marginalized artists, men and women, who worked outside of the primary discourse of the market and museum. These individuals, men and women, who sow the interesting seeds of discontent while working on a more granular level to create their own particular realities. How is that legacy conveyed? Are we forced in each generation to reinvent, again, alternatives, other ways of working? Or can we grasp the past to make our reality new? At this point in time, we have to acknowledge the fact that in our technologically sophisticated world, we may have the best chance for establishing a cultural legacy in a virtual world. While most of the artists that I know still create objects, on the internet you can be anyone. It may be that this is an illusion of parity, but certainly anyone with the time and access to the internet can create a space for their work online much more readily than they can access a way in which to share their work in real time and space. And that's particularly in New York City. I wonder if the virtual world may serve the same function for younger artists, a place where different realities can be shared and explored, and I'd like to hear from the other panelists on this topic. Back to what is the feminist legacy? I think we need to look at the idea of legacy in another way. If we link it to the object only, we will by necessity be forced to value ourselves as we are valued by the market, to let the judgment of buying and selling determine the value of our thought processes, actions, and finally the objects we create. If instead we look at artistic practice as a response to the demands of particular conditions and situations, we can start to think about legacy as an activity rather than as a series of objects that require preservation. As one writer has suggested, it does not seem enough to tell different stories and create multiple feminisms. Instead, she suggests that we need to tell stories differently. That may mean on some deeper level, abandoning an object-based practice that focuses on the final product. That in tandem with our efforts for parity and equality, we need to create spaces where we have the freedom to explore. And so I want to finish with a series of questions. 
Could a feminist legacy be the gift of seeing artistic practice, the multiple acts of creation rather than the object itself, as the focus of our artistic endeavor? Can we even momentarily escape the tyranny of the object and instead see artistic practice as a method of creating new narratives, new stories, rather than creating compelling objects? So my name is Raina Gossett, and um, in preparing for talking about feminist legacies, uh, I was thinking a lot about um, Sylvia Rivera, and, um, and I love this definition that you gave, um, Daria, of legacy means making trouble after you're dead. Um, and I think of uh, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson and, um, and the entire community of trans women of color uh, who were alive um, and in New York City and uh, rebelled at Stonewall and continued to build with each other uh, and also challenge feminist space um, and, and challenge it against uh, biologically notions determined biologically determined notions of gender um, and also challenge it um, with their bodies and interrupt um, a, another kind of feminist legacy. Um, so I'm thinking, this is a painting by Rachel Warner of Sylvia Rivera in 1973 at um, Washington Square Park. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But in, in, in thinking about feminist legacies, I think what, I re what resonates deeply with me are um, a group of people who are trans and gender non-conforming who have consistently pushed against feminist practices um, that have not made room for trans and gender non-conforming people who have been um, you know, for a very long time at the forefront of change, of social justice, uh, whether it was at Stonewall or whether it was organizing with people who were incarcerated or whether um, it was around sex work and sex workers' rights. I think about that as a kind of uh, legacy um, and a group of people who are really making trouble well after they have died. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about why that's something that resonates with me and um, some of uh, people I share community with. Um, so I think a, a lot of people in this room have heard of Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, but um, Sylvia Rivera was a Latina trans woman who was born in the 50s and um, one of the first people to rebel at Stonewall um, against the police and against the policing of gender and gender non-conforming people here in New York uh, and queer people. Um, she also helped to organize the Gay Liberation March, which is now known as Gay Pride, um, and which the first one started outside of the Women's House of Detention Center uh, with a chant, um, free ourselves, free our sisters, in order to intentionally connect um, the lives of people who are currently incarcerated to the people on the outside who were navigating the policing of their, of their gender and um, to break down that binary or the idea that like, uh, some people are inside and some people are outside and a lot of people who are trans and gender non-conforming are constantly going through um, barriers of criminalization and in institutions. Um, but then uh, in 1973, only four years after Stonewall, um, uh, Sylvia Rivera had to take the stage at the fourth anniversary of Christopher Street Liberation Day March um, to remind a movement uh, that the lives of people who are incarcerated um, and people who are trans and gender conforming were actually uh, vital to a vibrant movement uh, for feminism and for queer liberation, queer and trans liberation. Unfortunately, um, this was also a moment when um, feminists were organizing together to push out trans people from the movement. So um, I often play a clip of uh, lesbian feminist liberation leader Gina O'Leary um, taking the stage, specifically talking about how um, trans people mock women, and specifically talking about sex workers and people who do performance. Um, uh, so anyone doing it for profit. Um, so trans people who are out there you know, doing sex work for profit. And I think about that, those two things, um, about uh, sex work and about performance being two things that really um, riled up the lesbian feminist liberation, um, because those are two ways that trans and gender non-conforming people uh, 
have been able to access any kind of income uh, when we're shut out of formal economies. And so that's a kind of legacy that I'm going to be talking a little bit about tonight. Um, so in 2011, jumping forward um, 39 years, um, at a time when black and Latina trans women have the highest documented murder rate ever, um, uh, a woman named Cece McDonald in Minneapolis um, defended herself against a white supremacist and transphobic attack and um, was arrested for it um, and end up, ended up serving um, 19 months in prison. And uh, a group of friends, some of them are here tonight, um, friends and family, um, we wanted to make a connection between the work that Sylvia Rivera, Marsha B. Johnson, street transvestite action revolutionaries uh, were doing to connect their lives um, with the lives of people who are constantly navigating criminalization and then interrupt um, a movement that had moved away from that, that had driven um, a push for assimilation. Um, and so we did a performance um, with uh, partnering with Occupy Wall Street's Illumination Van, um, where we went throughout the city um, on the uh, on the 2012 Gay Pride and illuminated the message of Sylvia Rivera and Marcy P. Johnson, um, and uh, tried to interrupt the silences about um, how some people have been exiled from feminist space uh, under this. Uh, drive for assimilation. And so um, we made a short little video that we um, put all over the city that um, talked about uh, the origins of Stonewall um, and then also um, talked about safety and how um, when we're thinking about safety, uh, it's not actually something that we can get from the police or prisons. Actually, police and prisons are one of our primary predators. So we went throughout New York um, on specific places uh, that were sites of violence for trans and gender non-conforming people of color. Um, this is Sylvia Rivera speaking um, in 1973. Um, we played uh, this clip of Sylvia on top of Stonewall. Um, and people actually surprisingly really loved it. They like, came out of the building and they were cheering for Sylvia, um, which I think also is really a, an important part of the practice that I want to engage, which is the past. I firmly believe that the past and present and future are all engaged in our current political movement, and that's what I think about when I think about lineage. Um, and so I, I think about um, Sylvia Rivera making trouble um, and still doing it today, but also pushing um, for room for all of us to be able to survive. And so we in, hope to engage that legacy of Sylvia by, uh, and also publicize and uh, illuminate the case of C.C. McDonald. Um, and we did it also in sites of violence where trans um, and gender non-conforming people, particularly black and Latina and trans women, were um, experienced forms of violence. So this is the Washington um, Square Park Arch which is where Sylvia Rivera was speaking underneath um, to where we projected our free CC um, film. And then we also kind of went throughout the city um, talking about Pride being uh, a day, you know, that's become really corporatized, right, um, now, but it was started by people uh, like um, CC McDonald. Um, and this is a line that I really love, uh, We Cannot Live Without Our Lives, um, which is from a poem, but also is um, uh, a way that people organized in Boston um, in the 80s when, uh, after 12 black women were uh, found murdered uh, and the Kambahi River Collective came together um, and uh, folks marched under a banner of We Cannot Live Without Our Lives. Um, and I think that's a really strong part of um, the legacy that uh, people who are challenging feminist space to, um, to not erase uh, particular histories um, needs to, we need to constantly talk about. Um, and we ended on uh, 14th Street uh, and 8th Avenue, right near um, what used to be 
star house. So Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson and uh, Bambi Lamorne and Dora, um, these people who were from the, um, you know, Stonewall veterans organized a collective house together um, to house other trans and gender non-conforming people. Um, and we thought it would be really powerful to, to stop that or something. Um, I think, yeah, that's mostly what I wanted to share was um, an engagement in the form of practice that pushes us to remember um, that transphobia and gender, uh, biologically determined notions of gender are part of colonialism, right? So they're part of identities that were imposed um, on people since the Dutch landed in Manhattan um, and started the practice of um, you know, building a wall to keep uh, indigenous people out and started bringing forth ideologies of the gender binary. And I think it's really important to hold conversations of colonialism um, within conversations about feminist practice and feminist art uh, as a way to ensure that we're not, um, I think we had a really great point about these um, practices are still with us. It's like we can imagine that the 1970s was a more transphobic time, but actually our movements are, continue to be haunted by transphobia. Um, and on the flip side, our movements continue to be, um, uh, our movements continue to be bolstered by people who, because um, we can't just talk about the bad, right? I think it's really important to like not just vilify people and um, not just say that people are victims, right? But our movements continue to be bolstered by people who are engaging legacies of uh, gender self-determination and trans liberation, whether it's in feminist space or um, in uh, gender self-determining art space. Um, so, thank you. when I was invited to participate in the panel is that I would never have used um, the word legacy itself. Um, uh, I really retracted from the word, um, and that kind of retraction is actually extremely interesting to me. Um, I started to poke, I started to um, poke around the word legacy, um, looking at the etymology um, and the root of the word um, and sure enough, it exposed some of the sort of patriarchal core that I um, that I really resist. Um, the root of the word leg actually means law. Um, so legacy sits next to words like legal, lawful, legislative, legalize, um, legible, um, uh, legislative, uh, delegate, legitimate, um, and even the word um, privilege. Um, so I sort of started to go down a rabbit hole of kind of law, money, um, and religion, um, and the way that we uh, create standards and regulations uh, through which to manage the past and move it forward, and how often those standards are premised around a base of finance um, and the kind of value structures that are at play. Um, and in my hunting, uh, then I came across leger, which is uh, the present infinitive of lego, which shares kind of a common etymology, um, etymology <laughs> etymolo <laughs> etymological origin with the word legacy. Um, and the directives are, uh, one, I choose, select, appoint, two, I collect, gather, bring together, three, I take, steal, four, I traverse, pass through, five, I read, recite. And this was, um, this was actually sort of the first opening for me um, into the word. Um, 
and sort of kind of an unfolding the skin of the word. This was this was sort of the first time where I felt like I had an access point to even uh, registering registering that root within my own practice. Um, uh, like other people on the panel have suggested, I'm interested in new models, um, new formations of language, but more specifically how to invest kind of new meaning for pre-existing words um, as a way to offer kind of a shift which feels kind of more in tune with a, a sort of a social learning or a social meaning. I'm interested in horizontality and notions of nearness um, and the language of proximity as something that we can develop and engage as a way to begin to start to talk about some of the issues that everybody is sort of touching on. Um, I'm actually going to locate my position directly in my own work and the slides that are coming up um, because I kind of believe in totality and in the decision-making process that artists go through as like a very rigorous, materialized way of, of um, kind of embodiment. Um, um, so this first slide um, is from a performance called A Thing and Its Thingness. It's all just nouns and adjectives, baby. Um, which was performed this last October at the Museum of Art and Design. Um, the performance is based on Der Wald, which is an opera composed by Ethel Smith in the late 1800s. And Der Wald was the first and only opera composed by a woman to be performed at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York in 1903. But the opera has never been recorded. Um, a thing in its thingness uh, as a performance is sort of a deconstructed operatic response to uh, histo um, historical invisibility. I want to read a quote by Peggy Phelan from her book on Marked that I, I think is really relevant for kind of couching uh, this performance. Um, How can one invent a pedagogy for disappearance and loss and not for acquisition and control? How can one teach the generative power of misunderstanding in a way they will almost understand? Um, light is a really important material um, in my practice. I use it to frame space and to create interest and to engage looking as an active activity. Um, I use light to make space for a sort of photographic and image-based attention. I'm interested in staging a space for an image and the kind of anticipation um, or disappointments that get played out through engaging the making of a photographic image slowing down the moment of making image. Um, in this performance specifically, the lights were used and mediated by my body and strapped on sort of like bright appendages um, or slowly taken off um, and, and a place to sort of exaggerate the drama of the forest. Um, I often use my hands to sort of feather and shape and soften the light in an image. Uh, the piece also uh, heavily engages text. Uh, there was approximately about 40 minutes of reading in the piece. Um, it was loosely kind of a topographical combination of all the texts that I encountered while re researching Ethel Smith. Um, the opera had never been recorded, so my only access to the sense of the sound of the piece was through the various criticisms, the music criticisms that had been written after the performance uh, in 1903. Um, so this was combined with text from the actual libretto of the opera, uh, as well as my own accounts of digging up weeds in the industrial pockets of Mazpeth, Queens, where my studio is located. Um, in researching Ethel, I discovered that the New York Public Library housed 88 folders of letters from, uh, that had been written from Virginia Woolf to Ethel Smith, um, but because they were housed and the Woolf 
in the Wolf archive. None of the return correspondence from Smith had been included. Um, so this became another example of how we are left to look at something by looking around it um, and by looking at everything else that looked at it. Um, and that feels quite uh, particular to me. Um, there was a kind of a very fixed attention uh, for movement in the piece as a migration. Um, reading and lighting were sort of my primary focus throughout the performance and both were done simultaneously with a mic and multiple pages of text and lighting equipment, so kind of making for inevitable interruptions in the work. Uh, this is Malin Arnell, a performance artist who I invited uh, to be the feminist in my piece, and thankfully she agreed, and with no direction from me, she engaged her body in sort of a slow migration across the stage, shifting plants and the shadows projected from them as she went. I like to invite people to play roles in my work that are the roles they play in life without making any distinction. Um, and uh, I don't really like to tell people what to do or ask them to do anything um, specific. I also sort of also invite myself to participate in my own work by the same terms. And this has to do with some belief that uh, form is content and the way that we form ourselves is sort of representative of our ideology. Uh, and this is Mia Arandon. She is a somatic body worker who I invited to be in the piece with me. Um, my prompt to her was to treat the audience as a singular body and to, starting at the front of the, the front of the seating with myself, to kind of sneak her way through the audience and to do approximately like a minute of body work on each person as she went. Um, I'm also going to talk about a collaborative practice that I have uh, with my partner, A.K. Burns. Um, this, uh, the first project I'm going to present um, rather quickly is called The Brown Bear, neither particular nor general. Um, it's work that we installed in a space called Recess um, in 2010 in New York. Um, the Brown Bear is sort of the intentional conflation of a hair and art salon. And it was used as sort of a site for public engagement. So we offered free haircuts in tandem without the aid of mirrors or visual references throughout the two-month residency. And we engaged in discussions about preferences, desires, and aesthetic choices in relation to public and private socialized bodies. Um, the brown bear was an exploration of being and how it is, how it is formed, affirmed, and develops into cultural signifiers. So there were slotted shelves that we made to house archival material that we collected from LGBTQ and Q archives across the country. Um, we had been engaging the archive almost in a familiar way. Um, it's really rare that uh, queers have people within their biological families that they can look to and identify with. Um, so the archive sort of starts to operate like an extended family. Um, you may not have met, but there's a sense of belonging. Um, and the material that gets donated and held in the archive uh, also plays off of this sentiment because it's often, uh, often incredibly uh, personal material. Um, we kind of built out um, the entire space as a triangulated room and in the farthest wedge of the room we placed a Xerox machine, um, and the brown bear sort of operated like an exploded zine. People were invited to copy anything from the space that they wanted to take with them, and they were also invited to contribute anything they wanted um, to Xerox and leave behind. Simultaneously, and we've often been told by people that it's sort of a really fractured experience um, to have four people to have uh, four hands on you simultaneously, and it's actually something neither one of us has ever experienced because we are always engaged in the hair cutting, and that idea of sort of storytelling um, is something that really played out in the entirety of the project um, and in the space. Um, the hair cutting also became about touching and about the relevance and importance of touch in uh, sort of a recognition that there's not enough of that. Um, 
and that it generates an energy between people and that haircutting sort of offered a, a new space for people to actually feel each other in ways that we don't often engage. This was what two months of accumulated hair looks like. Um, we also invited uh, different artists to participate with us on a weekly basis, and specifically invited artists whose work don't privilege sight. Um, this is Sergio Tashopin, who uses the internal mechanism of speakers that vibrate in order to uh, have, to sort of have like a vibrational massage, a sound massage. Um, and lastly, this is sort of a piece that's unfinished um, and we're still working on. Um, titled Familiarity with Today is the best preparation for the future. A fitting title for this, uh, for this presentation. Um, so this is a work in progress. It's a three-channel video installation. Um, the content is a non-linear confluence of documentary, archival, and lived footage including a performance inspired by shaving fetish imagery from the 1970s, interviews with four older women, as well as archival footage from the 1939 and 1964 New York World's Fair in Corona Park today. Um, this is an installation shot actually from the Brooklyn Museum where we installed the piece for a one-day event in conjunction with the Hide Seek exhibit. Um, the piece starts with a pointing finger uh, locating sites on the panorama of the city of New York, which is uh, the title for the massive three-dimensional floor map of New York conceived by Robert Moses um, to celebrate the city's infrastructure in 1964, and it's housed at the Queens Museum. Uh, I like pointing because I think it's a way of presenting something as an interest and not as a fact. Um, the piece employs a particular strategy of mimicry, We've been introduced to archival footage shot by lesbians in 1964 at the World's Fair, and we wanted to return to Corona Park um, and refilm the same footage. Um, the pace consists of kind of many pairings of the same forms, uh, but basically shot 48 odd years later, um, allowing for a real shift in focus in terms of what has stayed the same or what has changed. Um, this one specifically is um, archival footage of the fountain from the World's Fair combined with what's kind of there today, which is mosaic work on the ground representing the fountains from that fair. Um, I'm really in interested in looking at archives, um, and again, this sort of pairing of images is about building transparency into the work. You see that we are looking at archival footage on a TV screen on the right, and then you see our attention um, has paused on a woman of interest on the left. And the voiceover makes it clear that the footage is shot by lesbians, not of lesbians inherently, so it brings attention to the kind of focus, framing, and decision-making that's evident in somebody's film work. Um, and I'm, like I said, really interested in notions of proximity. Um, this is, and how this kind of footage, this is a woman named Karen Song on the far right, and on the left is sort of vacation footage that I shot of AK at the Lobster Pound in Maine. And in the center is a beach shot from Fire Island in New York, and Karen is explaining her relationship to women's liberation and having lost her kids and job for being exposed as a homosexual. Um, and again, these pairings present a sort of forced simultaneity where we can ask what comes of these relationships and what kind of privileges do we have today due to the years of work done by previous generations. Um, the image on the left is from a shaving performance done by myself and AK at the end of our residency at recess, and it was inspired by archival shaving footage footage shown on the right from a 1970s dungeon scene in San Francisco, and we're really inspired by the images and interested in kind of limitations around pleasure that feel tied to history, and in this case, uh, the complications around feeling really attached to body hair. Um, 
Um, there's a lot of walking in the piece, so kind of tides moving in and out, and all of this sense of rhythm that's in tune with a human pace. Um, this is set against the kind of sped up narrative of time that happens when someone is telling their story. Um, this is Idri Fridun on the far left, um, talking about her experiences in Fire Island over the past 40 years, um, in combination with the shaving footage and also kind of house footage um, at a residency that we were at at Fire Island. Um, at moments, the work breaks into a space where three screens activate the same space and time simultaneously. Here we have three boardwalks, and all three are shot while we were walking, so the three screens sort of awkwardly, awkwardly jostle in an arrhythmic way to each other. And the piece ends um, in a culmination of sort of disco lights shot in Fire Island and layered uh, with the same sound. Um, and the piece as, as a whole sort of operates in many ways as sort of an exploded um, disco where there's a lot of, there's sort of a fracturing of um, one's ability to focus um, because of the simultaneity that's presented between the three screens. Thank you. Good evening, um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, everyone for being so attentive to the issue of legacy both on this side of the table and on the other side of the table. It's really a very important one. And in the context of this panel, um, Daria asked me to speak as both a mid-career artist and as an art historian. I'm the director of the Nancy Graves Foundation, which is dedicated to preserving and enhancing the legacy of a trailblazing female artist from a previous generation. And as such, Daria asked me to speak more specifically and perhaps more concretely to um, legacy issues with regard to the more standard and more traditional not-for-profit artist endowed foundations that are the typical model used by many artists to um, continue their legacy. And as we shall see, um, you know, this issue is of particular urgency for feminist or artists. It also requires a great deal of thought now, um, while we are still alive and active. This is the best time to found a foundation, as it were, um, to investigate innovative and uh, perhaps hitherto unexplored formats, something we've all been discussing amongst ourselves and, and in the panel, um, in order for our art um, and our legacy, um, individually and collectively, um, to avoid being devoured by either um, dumpsters or real estate taxes. I should have my, there we go. That's that. And this is the actual um, topic here, is um, death-defying art, avoiding the dumpster and the IRS. Those are the, the, the twin evils. Okay, but before I started, I wanted to just do a very, very brief presentation of three examples of my more recent work. This Rosarian collage, which is a kind of a commemoration um, of the um, 10th anniversary of the um, Twin Tower collapse, is made of um, 99 cent store um, roses that I have covered with a metal leaf and gold leaf and adhered to um, a canvas background. And this is an installation from last year. Um, the little one is just to show the scale. So it's a 40 foot high um, textile, a uh, silk textile called Great Falls. And it um, documents the fall of the textile. The local textile industry it was installed in the former textile factories in Silk City, Patterson. And it also documents the fall of labor rights that accompanied the many early um, labor protests around World War I. And then here, another piece um, and a performance that I did in a land, piece of land art that I did um, called the Laurentian Labyrinth. And this was um, Ariadne's red thread performance using shiny red danger tape that you would buy in a hardware store, which looked like a glistening trail of blood. So you can see that um, these three images just show examples of my work in various scales and also from a range of periods. So I made both transitory installations and actual objects. And all of my work originates um, 
um, within the concepts and techniques of collage, and they combine very different materials with fragments of history and of personal significance. But I really um, wanted to speak much more to um, um, legacy issues and introduce very briefly Nancy Graves, who was an American artist who lived from 1939 to 1995. Um, she's probably best known for the Trio of Camels, which was a conceptual sculpture. It was an assemblage of very lifelike looking camels at the Whitney Museum. And the bottom slide I just thought I would throw in because she had a massive sculpture retrospective here at the Brooklyn Museum, in case that doorway looks familiar to anyone. Um, she, um, this is her wonderful portrait by Robert Mapplethorpe, and she was also a filmmaker, a printmaker, and designed um, sets and costumes um, for ballets. And she did her MFA in um, painting at Yale and was also a wonderful painter. So what is legacy with regard to not-for-profit, artist-endowed foundations? That's a massive mouthful. Um, and most importantly, how can this traditional legacy format be adapted to serve the legacy of feminist art? So most artists, even best-selling artists, tend to have and make much more art than they sell in their lifetimes. And this is uh, much more obviously the case for artists that make objects, paintings, and sculptures. And what happens to all of this art at their death? And what is it worth to the next generation? And what part of it is worthwhile to the next generation? So if the IRS is asked, that work will be worth a tremendous, stupendous amount once it passes down to your designated heirs. Not when it passes laterally to a spouse, but when it goes down to the next generation. And this evaluation arises not because the IRS is full of art lovers, but so that huge estate taxes can be collected based on a high assessment of this art's potential value. So tax-exempt foundations are formed in part to protect your designated heirs from these huge estate and inheritance taxes, especially in case your heirs cannot afford to pay them. Because if your heirs cannot afford to pay them, tragically, the inability to pay these taxes is what sends untold quantities of artwork into the dumpster. Or if you are really lucky, it ends up at the local thrift shop. So foundations can be um, family-run or board-run. You may not have heirs, and you may also have heirs that are not interested in running an art foundation or that you don't trust with running your art foundation. So as is the case for all not-for-profits, organizations, any kind, a foundation must also offer a public benefit, such as an educational mission, which is often the case for um, art foundations, or a mission to support the arts and artists beyond what is known as the self-serving function of legacy enhancement. That's not enough. So, not wanting to spend the whole night talking about the IRS, that would be really dreadful. So, the primary reason, however, um, that art foundations are established is because historically, this is the format that has assured artists the greatest possible control over their legacy over um, their work and their life's intent and output so that they can continue to make trouble after they die, as Dorian said, which, when you think about it, might be a very good form of public good and qualify as a charitable um, organization. So, one of the um, myths, um, the great pervasive myths, is that um, an artist's work is worth more after they are dead. Now, this myth endures in the popular imagination, in countless books and movie and play plots, and even more insidiously in many artists' minds. But nothing could be further from the truth. Unless your art, and here we are back in the marketplace, unless your art has acquired high actual market value during your own lifetime, while you yourself were promoting it and exhibiting it, your work will not instantly gain added value just because you want it. Quite the opposite is sadly true. And many artists do not realize this when thinking about issues of legacy. 
somebody or some organization needs to continue to do all of that promoting and exhibition organizing and sending out of images and writing of texts in your stead for your work to continue to be given consideration and for it to have meaning or influence and thus value after you're gone. And basically that's what legacy is. So when thinking of legacy, you know, foundations as diverse as the Warhol Foundation, the Paul and Krasner Foundation, the Joe Mitchell Foundation, or the Gottlieb Foundation um, immediately come to mind. And you, in fact, may have applied for funding from some of these foundations, which is their charitable mission, and gives them, the, um, among other things, the um, tax exempt status. So this is definitely not the forum to describe, even briefly, the complexities of setting up and administrating an artist's foundation or of fulfilling its mission. But the basic requirement for setting up this type of foundation is simply money. And creating a legacy by establishing a foundation requires an unfathomable amount of funding to set up, followed by continual financial resources to support it over time. And the list on the screen goes on and on and on and on, and that's why I sort of just let it trail off like that. And um, one of the issues that is extremely relevant um, to the establishment of a legacy for feminist artists and women artists is just looking at art market pricing. So art market pricing leaves even very successful women artists very far behind. You can see from these graphs, so these are the top female artists between 2008 and 2013. So if you look at the asterisk for Joan Mitchell, you can see that she um, has the highest, she has the world record for the greatest amount of money ever paid for a single work by a woman artist. And that's, you know, 9.3 million something dollars. You can see that even that high record from 2011 is a couple of, not just million dollars, but a couple of decimal points different from the highest paid price for male artists. So that fact alone, the financial requirements alone that are impacted by the market value of the art produced by women will negatively impact all individual artists who did not achieve this top tier level on the marketplace. But it'll have a particularly negative impact on the future of feminist art as a whole, as well as individually, and on the entire artistic legacy of feminist arts. So women artists, um, feminist or not, um, as the guerrilla girls still need to demonstrate, continue to remain vastly underrepresented and outsold by male artists in galleries and auction houses. So as a result, though they might be very famous, Many women not risk not having sufficient assets, such as basic cash savings or highly market valued and saleable artwork, of real estate, for example, to establish a financially viable foundation at the end of their critically acclaimed lives. So feminist artists, um, though recognized as continuing to drive so much of contemporary art, risk not having a future history unless we develop some new models now to preserve and activate that legacy. And I just have one more slide to show you that, um, again, looking at this image of the leap into the void, that there are really no immediate solutions, but together we really have to explore a number of ideas as to continue this absolute necessity to archive fiercely in order to leave a tangible trace of one's lifetime project and um, contributions. So if we still remember Eve Klein's um, leap into the void, it's because he documented the event photographically, then published the photo himself in a pseudo-newspaper, a special Sunday edition that he printed and distributed to kiosks throughout Paris and then further documented that distribution so that the fact of the event, this performative event, which was kind of fake anyway, um, continues to exist and have any kind of value um, for the future. So these are the kind of a possible starting points to uh, open up um, such a discussion. So thank you very much.
Thank you, panelists, for sharing your points of view and what you've experienced uh, in the realm of legacy. I hope we didn't scare you half to death just now by Christine's presentation. It does sound pretty hopeless, but then we don't have to be Nancy Graves, right? Uh, we can be whoever we want to be. So um, we've opened up this topic from many different points of view with some common threads <coughs> running through them. Uh, some of them may have been in the marketplace, some of them may have been uh, a very wonderful idea from Raina that uh, being transgender, non-conforming, and queer are anti-capitalist acts. So we've got real estate in there, we've got uh, anti market and capitalist ideas, but I wonder if, um, first, if the panelists have any questions for each other or want to bring anything else up before we throw this open to the audience. Anybody? Well, I think we've talked long enough and want to hear from you now. So, um, was there anything that was said that you would like to have um, uh, looked at a little more deeply or uh, if you'd like to work into the microphone, Jesse will give you the microphone, actually, and you could add your thoughts to what we've opened up tonight. Do I see anyone? I'm sorry. As you're sitting in shock here from listening about <laughs> <laughs> the bad news, think about the good news, that the question is wide open that we need to tell our stories differently. How can we tell our stories differently? Oh, we have a volunteer. Over there, Jesse. <laughs> yes, good. When you talk, please give us your name because we'd like to get back to you later. My name is Joan Arminder. Thank you for your program. Uh, did you say that the fact that Joan Mitchell earned nine million plus dollars on one painting has in fact negatively impacted the problems we would have with the IRS as women artists. I don't, she, she did not earn nine million dollars. The painting sold for nine million dollars? No, but the, oh, uh, does the IRS not now think that women's artwork is worth more than it used to be? Yeah, obviously, but it's still, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's an irony there, a big one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, but, the, but the, I guess the point I was trying to make was that the gap is still enormously wide. I think, Christina, you were trying to point out that it's much more difficult for women to take on this idea of the foundation anyway as individuals because they simply don't have the resources. That's what you were pointing to and that it's necessary to be more creative and to also think about things perhaps as, you know, as a group rather than as individuals because you can't simply finance it on your own. Which brings us back to maybe some of Leah's ideas about what happened in the 70s. Yeah, I think so. I think in the way that sort of leaving, you know, getting off the grid or finding a different kind of model. I mean, certainly, I mean, Dara, you have a lot of experience with you know, setting up collectives. Um, yes. And uh, it, of course, it's difficult. There's always a lot of politics um, everywhere in a situation like that. But certainly, um, groups of like-minded artists pooling their resources, pooling their assets, having one storage facility, having one database, having one insurance policy, one you know, uh, workers' compensation policy, one heating system, you know, one art handler. I mean, certainly that is a way to reduce a lot of the costs. I mean, there are just incredible um, storage, insurance, and administrative costs involved in, you know, setting up and especially maintaining a foundation, especially I mean, if you, you know, have a foundation where, you know, the sale of each work generates $50,000, you have a couple, you know, your computer breaks down, you sell something for, I mean, $50 million, and you've got 50 million extra dollars, but that is not often the case for, you know, artists, all artists, and especially women artists, whose individual works simply aren't um, valued on the marketplace at that level, and um, you do need those funds, it really comes down to funding rather than ideas or creativity in order to set up this type of foundation. Yeah. So you understood that, right? Well, you know, uh, I have to say that AIR is a very simple model. 
I think the way to go is cheap and simple. And, you know, something that is uh, commensurate with your wallet, basically. When you get a group of people together, you can do an awful lot. And so, uh, you know, we're looking at models that were so-called too big to fail. I mean, that's the mantra for a lot of things today. Big eats a lot of money. We don't have that money, but we don't have to be big. So, uh, you can look at groups that are very inexpensive, that are driving the whole, the whole show, like Facebook and Etsy. These are big, big models with a lot of uh, people in them, basically. And that's the systems that are living and breathing today. So, group projects, any way you can think of it, is the way to go. And these models are not hard to follow. And I think this community is creative enough, certainly brave enough to ask these very varied questions tonight about their particular constituency and what they know about life from where they live and see. That we have to come up with something, even if it's co-ops of the dead, we have to think of something creative. <laughs> to continue our work, to preserve the people that we value, and uh, to give something over to the next generation as material to work with. Because, you know, my generation, we still had real estate options. Yours doesn't, for the younger ones here. It's all been closed up. But we have that now, you know, uh, we didn't expect to have it. I mean, we had nothing when we were your age either. But now that we have it, we could do something with it. We might be able to support a few young art historians with it, or something. You know, we'll have to think of some way to do it. One of the conversations that Daria and I have had is in comparing um, things that were going on when she was a young artist and some things that are a part of my community. We realized how many similarities there were that we weren't aware of. And I felt like people around me are so often kind of reinventing the wheel, trying to come up with solutions. And we, felt, we realized that if there was more dialogue between people of different generations, we might be able to, um, to, to be able to tap into some of these resources that Daria is talking about. And we were also hoping that getting a big group of people together like this, representing so many different ages and different practices, that we might be able to facilitate some conversations and some meetings that might not happen otherwise. Ah, now we have a question. <laughs> I wanted to uh, throw out another image. What's your name? Oh, sorry, my name is Michael Moser. Um, and picking up on Leah's image of the gene song, which brought to my mind um, the videos that were going around of the feminine women from Ukraine. The, um, for those of you who may not know, they're, they're sex workers from Eastern Europe who tend to take off their clothes and throw themselves at police officers. They're incredibly brave. And they shout things like, we are poor because of you. And there was um, a recent action that they did where they took a chainsaw and a woman, had she had no top on, and she chainsawed down this huge important monument in I think the Ukraine um, and was arrested for it. They get arrested all the time. Um, and to me, that represents all kinds of ideas of propagation, activism, and also legacy, the utilization of online uh, resources. Um, and they're also a, a commune, or if not a commune, they're a cooperative art group. <coughs> interesting, very interesting. Is someone else over here?
relished now for future generations through photography and through the internet. Um, I think people like Nancy Graves, who I knew by the way, um, um, we made real, real things, objects, okay? And that's where the problem comes in. Um, and so I have written this, and I'm not sure. I mean, all of you, uh, there's a whole generation, I mean, sitting up there that, um, when, that went to colleges that had, gave MAs and master's degrees. And so you speak in a way that I don't even understand, okay? Um, I'm 80 years old. And so when I went to college, there were very few places that had art departments. Um, maybe three, as a matter of fact. So I'm listening to with two different ears. So there's the Christina side. She's dealing with an artist who has real stuff, okay, in the art market, and, and gets valued in one way. And I'm, by the way, this has nothing to do with being female. Okay, I think it's in general. I live with a man who has a studio full of work where he, we don't know what's going to happen to him. He's a brilliant photographer. He's Japanese American and he's terribly shy. And he would have probably a few breakdowns if he had to have, be involved with the, with the art market. So I wrote this out. After having a conversation with Christina Starr about this symposium tonight, I woke the following morning what I'm proposing will be a rather difficult undertaking and may not be possible at all. It speaks to your idea of community. Um, the idea would be to find spaces, maybe salt mines, you know, the Nazis did that. I mean, they had made art from the Nazis. Or places somewhere in America to house works by deceased artists. Um, imagine the Dia, the Dia Foundation upstate in Hudson, New York, or perhaps many more repositories on a grand scale for unknown art. Since I couldn't envision more, I started to think of foundation names, and since it's such a serious subject, decided to have some fun. I hope you don't find oh, this. I'm going to interrupt you because, uh, what? To give a nod to the younger audience, they're kind of faster than we are, so I want to make sure they have time to also uh, voice their opinions. So if you could just get to, uh, if, I, would, I don't want to miss any of your good points, but if you get to your main point, there are some My people waiting. My point would be that but there, there might be, we might be able to set up spaces or foundations that would, would house paintings and sculpture and photography, um, installations represented by photography photography, um, and that especially for artists who have never really been, whose works have never been seen, or even famous artists whose works have never been seen, it's totally out. I, mean, I, was, I was playing around with the Great Lock Yard Collection, Dead Art Society. Um, well, it all makes a lot of sense because uh, we are looking for different solutions, but what you're bringing up is a very important idea of having conversations, you know, having five people get together for a glass of wine and throwing this kind of thing around and seeing what the value is. Oh my gosh, I mean, I feel like I've said something wrong, have I? No, you haven't. No, that just, it's just a time thing. We'll move on to another, another question. Hi, my name is MPA. Um, I might be the one that's going to throw a wrench into the panel, but I think that what I'm doing sitting right here is what are the shared politics maybe between members on the panel? And I see a lot of ideas being tossed around and maybe not we've not even arrived yet on a table of possibly shared terms of what we feel around capitalism and um, legacy. A few people on the panel, uh, Deborah, Raina, uh, Katie, were bringing up even possibly the contamination in the assumptions of legacy and feminist le legacy and that contamination is influenced by colonizing and capitalist practices that are part of our present. Um, so from that point of view, I'm wondering maybe from the panelists if they want to talk about um, other personal politics that can begin to inform and redefine feminism. I personally don't know if feminism is a term I've uh, a 
allowed myself since Occupy Wall Street to really tagline because Occupy Wall Street in New York reopened the table for politics and myself identifying with particular ones. Um, in terms of practical strategies, um, if we want to turn to Jack Smith or uh, the Communist Party in the in the, um, New York in the turn of the century, there were rent strikes that did happen here in um, our city, and there seems to be a lot of discussion around real estate, but um, on the table, and that's that's also being threatened and connected to art property. And maybe if we begin to link those struggles, we also earn another vision for uh, feminism right now. Anybody here want to address that question? Does stir any thinking? That's a massive question. Yeah, yes. I think it's, that's why it's, it's a kind massive of hard question. To delve so into it. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you for so much for linking the notions of real estate, money, capitalism, politics, personal politics, the current political situation, and parallels to you know other you know decades in the past, and no doubt things we need to anticipate as well for the future. But those are those are huge and obviously really really. Um, maybe not so obviously interrelated um, threads um, that will impact you know, any kind of historic legacy that, that is going to be left for the next generation. Thank you. Yeah, and I don't think we're trying to suggest that we have the answers up here, and we're hoping that people in the audience might be able to respond to each other as well. So we hope this will be a dialogue and not just mm -hmm. a presentation. Or yeah. even just a catalyst for a dialogue. <laughs> Definitely. We don't have the answers, but what's new about tonight's session, for me at least, is I'm hearing from constituencies that I never ever run into, and I think that's wonderful. I'm hearing things like, well, maybe the next step in 70s feminism is not to get labeled at all. If they can't label you, they can't put you down. You know, maybe we have to run away from labels. We might also turn the heads on capitalism uh, instead of rejecting it, or, you know, while we document our work with photographs and do um, some kind of archiving as the last speaker spoke about, the previous speaker. We might also think about the fact that the younger generation needs jobs and money which are also going by the wayside. How are they going to afford their life for the next 50, 60, 70 years? Well, maybe our generation can leave something for them to work with. Maybe we have something we can pass on to them. Maybe we can be their medium if we leave them some money or a way to live. Why can't this community support itself? So that's some of the questions I think about. Do I have the nerve to do that? I think there are some questions over here. Too. Yes. Hi, this isn't the question. I'm Rachel Grenicke. I'm Donna Byers' granddaughter. She's one of the early members of AIR. And so I'm currently in the process of trying to archive, help my grandmother archive her entire body of work. So I'm very, I'm very sympathetic to this issue. And I think that we have a collective here of women who would be willing to meet like once a month and start the discussion. So my proposition is to, I mean, even ask the Brooklyn Museum if we can you know, same time next month and just have women start showing up and have an organized system for being able to express what we need to talk about. Say again? It, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be women. Feminists. That's what I meant. Sorry. Feminists. <laughs> I don't think it's, it's, it's about, I mean, my suggestion is to get together with people that have anything invested in the, the feminist issue, let's just make it a big blanket term, and say that we can meet once a month and start with one meeting, get together and see what happens. I'm not saying that you can't talk about what you want to talk about or different people aren't allowed in. Hi, my name is Annalisa Jensen and I'm with the Chart Collective. We're nomadic, we don't have a space and there's like four of us. But just two quick, we're here tonight. Uh, two quick points. Uh, one uh, direct link that I can see 
uh, in terms of everything that's been talked about is, for example, uh, in a couple of months there will be a big open engagement conference that takes place at the Queen's Museum, which is about art, artists working with communities, making and making things happen. And I cannot see that taking place without feminism having proceeded. It's just like there are these historical links and they're movements that move and they keep changing and the communities within communities. And, and so then the second point I wanted to make is just also all these then communities that keep on expanding. I mean, our asexuals are part of the queer community. How do we begin to even think about the approaching the body and the body in the work? And, and, and that's something I was wondering if any of you have thought about, or maybe other people. Yeah, I'll just throw out questions. You could take them home in your mind and work on them in your sleep. So, <laughs> the best time. Hi, good evening. I was also inspired by the last speaker here. Uh, my name is Patty Jordan, and I'm with the Women's uh, Caucus for Art, the New York chapter. And I was very um, taken, um, particularly by um, Catherine Hubbard's work in doing that um, collective space gathering where you actually kind of take over a space and you create a performance, but you've also documented it for us all to see. And we're very interested also in finding alternative spaces. But I'm curious too, you've documented it, and the, uh, something that was also mentioned, this ability for us to potentially use the internet to sort of be proactive with our work as a space to then um, talk about it, write about it, chat about it. Are you using the internet? And also, do you invite writers to come to your um, your shows and wanted to, to write about it? Um, let me see if I can thread a couple of things together that have been brought up. Um, in terms of putting my work on the internet, I don't have a website, so if things appear online, it's only because other people have opted to put them there, but I'm also not on Facebook and I'm not on Twitter, um, and I don't use social media in any way um, intentionally, although I find out at a later date I might have uh, there might be a personality out there somewhere that people affiliate with me. Um, so, and also I think I'm, I consider myself to be primarily a photographer, but I'm incredibly particular about when and how I employ photography. So it's true that in the case of documentation, I go to great lengths to take as much of what gets created in the real time, in the physical kind of uh, sculptural, and take that with me uh, to kind of have as a reference for later points, but I'm also really interested in the idea of image production um, and in the role of photography. Um, and so a lot of the performance work that is um, that uses light is sort of about asking questions about what how photography operates and functions for us. It's not inherently always about making photographs very concerned with documenting uh, what happens in that space, but in the case of the performance, I'm much more interested in holding a space with light that's about how image production is operating for us in a contemporary social sphere. Um, and the question about if I invite writers is really interesting because maybe this links back to some of what MPA was um, bringing up, which for me, somehow, what everybody is bringing up, I simultaneously love all of the suggestions, and then I have like a really intense cringe factor. And um, I think that there's something important about um, kind of affiliation um, or association that's kind of at question in all of these groups, these kinds of ways that we ask, like, how do we come together and how do we group? Um, and I think it's. Uh, there's there's something um, there's something about like a very sort of loose kind of associative structure that brings like-minded people together and starts to kind of act as what we recognize as community. Um, and in terms of writers, um, in the case of the Brown Bear, we did invite writers to perform in the space with us and to make work. Um, to make kind of to bring their writing practice into the space as a performance.
performance, as an engagement with performance. Um, but I also happen to be very close friends with writers, and if they come to my performances, and if they do or don't opt to write about something, it's purely out of their own volition. And but the question of kind of um, affiliation, I think, comes up because it sort of begs like. Where, who are the minds you position yourself next to, um, and who are the minds that you sort of want to be doing this thinking with, and those are the people you should be spending your time with. Um, because for me, like, the everything is generative towards the kind of principles that um, start to be shared within the group, and really start to negate some of these ideas around ownership and I think collaboration is a really important strategy for um, starting to restructure some of the thinking. I know Janine is. All I wanted to hear was what you were about to say. So you picked up the mic and Had I known that was your question, I wouldn't have. <laughs> I, I think I was going to talk about a couple of things. I think I was going to, um, like, I feel uncomfortable in conversations about real estate that don't come with acknowledgement that we're on colonized land. I feel, uh, and that we're, like, a lot of these institutions were built with, um, with labor that was never compensated vis-a-vis uh, -vis the transatlantic slave trade. And, um, reparations, and uh, I think about that when I think about Fire Island, uh, because Fire Island was a place um, for people who were black, who were being held before they were brought to New York um, through the transatlantic slave trade, and, I, and also um, on top of that being an incredible place for um, where people inhabit their bodies in the practice of like, queer liberation and feminism. But I think. For me, it's essential, um, and one of the reasons why we didn't share, so um, it was my partner Liz and a few people over here, we came together to do the C.C. McDonald Illumination Project, and one of the reasons that we didn't share it online, um, I think, was thinking about intentionality, and thinking about, for me, it's um, capitalism so quickly is, uh, co-ops what you put out there. So I remember being at a speech where Angela um, Davis was talking about uh, how she was riding around in the 60s and she saw uh, a cigarette ad with someone rocking a daishiki, which is like um, part of um, black nationalist culture that was firmly against capitalism, right? And so it's, um, for me, I think it's really, uh, in these conversations, it's really essential to think about how even resistance um, to capitalism, he's been pushing back against, uh, like, for example, um, how it's really important for me to be like, well, feminist space, it's, you know, we have to have some conversations about transphobia. Like, even that pushback is one that can be co-opted, right? Um, and thinking about um, the market and, you know, uh, just having a, wanting to trouble these, like, ideas that um, there could be, like, a, unhurtful market or an unhurtful um, way to engage in real estate um, or that uh, there's an uncomplicated way to, uh, to share your work. Um, so I think that's some of the stuff that uh, MPA is questioning. I think on that note, it's getting to that hour where we should say thank you to everyone. Leo, do you have any closing words? And so yeah, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming, and I hope that we can continue this conversation in some capacity, one way or another. We hope that this is the start of something. Yeah, thank and the museum is open.